Welcome into tonight's Bluegrass Breakdown radio show. We got a good little show tonight, February 23rd. And before I get into it, I'd just like to big thanks to Joel Gastright. Uh, the intro video there, good friend of Ryan here, uh, Kelly, I should say. Yeah, I haven't heard of that until just now. I mean, looks, looks the part that looks kind of like Elton John in it. When did he and do a that? shower scene. I mean, it's a yeah. nice video. It's, I was not expecting that. Uh, it's a curveball. It's a curveball. That's not the Joel, the Joel Gastrite I'm used to. Anyways, it's going to be a good show tonight. We've got a couple good guests coming on. First off, uh, in the second segment, national writer for CBS.com, Gary Parrish, will join us to talk some cats and cards with him. Uh, he had an article out yesterday, Praise in Kentucky some, so I'll definitely get into that. And then the last segment, maybe third segment, who knows, we'll get Brent Lepping from VolvoSportsLive.net. So we've got a pretty good show. We've got some good guests coming on. We'll be able to talk about all the UK and U of L. UK had a big game against Mississippi State over the weekend. Pulled that out. Louisville has a game tomorrow night. Kelly, tonight. Tonight, tonight, not tomorrow. That's right. Big game at nine. I, I don't know. I, I was uh, talking to my buddy, and he was saying, you know, wouldn't Louisville expect to win this game? Um, and I said, you know, no, I don't think Louisville expects to win this game at all. It's at Cincinnati. Pretty close to being, you know, a big rivalry game, I'd say. Um, Will Yancey Gates punch anybody tonight? I don't know. Hopefully not. Hopefully he doesn't hurt anybody. He would, uh, I hope so. He would knock somebody out. So? He already knocked that dude out. Uh, I, I kind of – I'm going to agree to disagree with you here. You think Louisville will win? I, I think Louisville's going to win this game. I think it's a game that Louisville – I think Louisville should. I, don't, I wouldn't say should. Do you? I Since think they what? I think that they. Sh- I think they're going to win. Because you're a Kentucky fan, and you think, oh, everyone should win. Oh, we win. You guys should. If win. I were a Kentucky fan, I would no, want really? Cincinnati to win. What's that? I don't hate UC. I like UC actually a lot. Why do you so like why, Cincinnati? Why would we go into you're it Xavier. expecting Hold to win? On. They have an identical. I'm not saying conference expecting record. to win. I think that they're going to win. We have an Xavier alumni saying she likes Cincinnati. I honestly really think that Louisville's on an upper trajectory, and I think that they honestly will win this game. And if they don't, it's going to be – everybody's going to be – are you going to be disappointed? I'll be disappointed if exactly. they lose. I won't make fun of Louisville if they lose. I don't – I won't either. I, I don't think – if they lose, it's a road game to Cincinnati who's – And Cincinnati uh, can be really good. They are good. They're, well, they're mm, – but they have their moments. What, what was that? They have their moments. I wouldn't say they're good. They have their moments. When you least expect it, they'll come through. But I – I wouldn't be surprised either way, Everybody but I think Louisville will win it. I do too. I think Louisville will Sorry win. Sorry for having game. hope over here. I, I don't mind. Side. It's just every Kentucky fan says, "Oh, you guys, no, oh, yeah, you should assume you're going to win that game." Oh, so I you're going to assume you're going to win? Just Kentucky oh, okay. fans, like, "Oh, if you don't, don't then what's down. wrong? Something's wrong." I don't I didn't mean say that. Assume. I, think, I said I, I agree to disagree. <laughs> if I think you're going to lose and you should lose, I'll let you know. But no, they have identical Big East conference records, and it's at Cincinnati, so we'll see. Yeah, that's they've the got what I, the blackout tonight. Yep. For it. That's retarded. That stuff's so I, dumb. My brother, I hate it too. My brother will be at the game and. Oh yeah. Wearing, wearing he lives red. up there, doesn't he? He's a. He work, lives does he work more, with the more northern Ohio. Does he still work with the Bengals or whatever he was doing? No. No. Nope. What, what was there? The Reds. Um. Nope. Uh, Joel worked, worked with the Dolphins. The guy we just. I know. I knew Joel was doing stuff with the sports industry. Um. Michael, my dad got to throw out the first pitch of a Reds game. I remember that. I remember that. May have been with. But nonetheless, um, Kentucky had a nice. I picked Kentucky to lose against Ole Miss, Mississippi State. Mississippi I'm sorry. State. No, no. You're, you're, I mean, you're right. We played Ole Miss before Mississippi State, uh, but you weren't talking that game. No, no. I, I was talking Mississippi State. I picked them to lose, and in the first half, it looked like they were going to. Down 13 at halftime. Uh, Tell you what, there's a decent part of the second half. It looked like they were going to. I'd say part. most of the game it looked like they were going to until Darius Miller dunked on a guy, and I would like to go ahead and have Matt. The producer throw that clip up for everybody to watch since we're talking Mississippi State game. Kentucky was down, I believe, nine points or so, and ten points at this time, or about seven minutes ago. Darius Miller just got the ball in the paint. He had to score it all night and just threw it down. 
And that's what sparked the run. And I believe it was 20 to 4 from there. Kentucky was down 13 and a half. They came back and won by 8. They covered, or 9, I believe, or whatever it was. They covered the spread regardless, which the score definitely doesn't show the result of the full game. Mississippi State, I mean, first half they didn't miss. D Boss had 16 points. Did you watch this game? I know Danielle did. I did. Did you catch it? I, I ca- caught some of it, yes. It was a. It was a great ending. Um, I mean, Kentucky, Mississippi State couldn't score in the last three minutes, but I just think that was. I said it last show. The Vanderbilt win was the best win. Well, this is definitely the best win. Don't you agree? I think it proves that they can be down that much for that long in the game and still pull it out. I mean, that's going to be that's going to be as close to if for the people who think that they need a loss, that's as close as you're going to get without getting a loss that you're going to learn from. Yeah, that's I don't. Close. I don't like all that talk of I think getting they a proved loss. Proved a lot. I don't know if you, I mean, a loss will work, but I also think that a no. close game that you end up pulling out from, you know, the skin of your teeth works as well, too, which is what they did. Oh, and yeah. it was awesome. Sure. Kid Gilchrist had double-double, 18 points. Darius Miller as well uh, had 12 points. Uh, Davis had to double-double, 13 and 11. He had a couple, just a couple blocks. They did. Moultrie is a beast down low. He was a, he's a top 10 draft pick. Uh, he kind of kind of contained Davis throughout the game, but, I mean, he did his thing. The Cats pulled it out. It was a great win. Rick Stansberry. Had a little karma come back to him a couple days before the game. He called out his former player, Twani Beckham. He said uh, something on the line of, I saw stats the other day in SEC play. Did he make it or attempt a shot? Uh, he seems pretty good b-ball there. Uh, he's getting a front row ticket every night. Would yeah, that's a, He said that was out of context. That's a direct shot towards his former player. But I don't care. it's true. I mean, it's very true. It's very true. It's true. But a man up and say. You still don't yeah. say it. He tried to say it was out of context. There's, I would say it. I don't care. I, I don't care. Cal can talk about his former players. I don't care. Talk about him. But Me man either. up and at least say I said it. Because then Twani, you know, responded with the. He wants we, to coach where I'm at. He's not worried at all. And the cats come out. You know, they pulled out. Rick's now saying we're better than the '96 team. So brings up an interesting point. If you're Twani Beckham, you play for Mississippi State. And then you transfer to Kentucky. Let's assume, for the sake of the conversation, Twani grew up. All big blue. And he doesn't play this year or next year. Was it, I mean, was it a, the right decision? It's his decision. He, I think it's, it's his, his decision. decision. He might just, even get a ring out of it. It's his decision to transfer out of Mississippi State, and he decided to come back home. He's from Louisville guy. Um, there was no room for, on Louisville's roster. I don't. I have no idea if he wanted to even go to Louisville, if they even were looking at bringing him in. Cal accepted him. He's on the roster. He's accepted his role, so, you know, he's fine. But my question is, for him, he probably has some aspirations to uh, play professionally, maybe not if in the NBA, but somewhere afterward. Do you think this is his best decision? I'm sure his – I think it's better than being at Mississippi State if he wants to do that. I mean, at least he's going to have the Kentucky. I I don't disagree with that. No, I don't. He needs to play to get into the NBA, and he's not going to play at Kentucky. At the same time, he's going to have the Kentucky name on it. Say next year. It doesn't matter. Say next year, he actually gets in there, he puts in some good minutes. He won't. Not bad. He, he at least has that behind him. I completely think that it's much. He better won't than play though. State. He's got too many talent, too much talent in front of him. Maybe when he's a senior, we don't know who's coming in that year. I don't think did Daniel needs- Orton play? Barely, yeah. a little bit. Yeah, off the bench. How many minutes did he Only play? Only because he was 6'10". I don't know how many minutes he played. He, he was, did a lot of goaltending because I remember he that played. he played enough minutes he to make me angry whenever he'd goaltend about eight times a day. It was twenty. Didn't hasn't played. Moving on, UK's women. They're playing right now against Vanderbilt. Uh, check that out. I believe in the, they have senior night coming up on the 23rd. So uh, tune into their game. Might, I'm not sure if it's televised or not. You can find it on the radio. So go cheer on them. If you want to give us a call on the Brucey's call-in line, it's 502-265-5211. If you don't know what Brucey's is, it's our newest advertiser. Uh, check them out on Brucey's.com. They have some pretty good stuff on there, uh, mainly glasses. They're not just you know your sunglasses, tailgating gear. Uh, they have bottle, bottle openers at the end of the uh, whatever you want to call it, the ear piece. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, they come in a uh, bottle koozie to keep uh, keep them safe and keep your drink cool. So check them out. They're good, good little advertisers. We're glad to have them on board. Um, Louisville, they played. They have a game tonight. As we said, we'll get into that a little bit later. We got Brent Lepping. We definitely get into that with him. Uh, they played DePaul. They an overtime game. 90-82. to 82. Did you see that? Yes, I did. Overtime with DePaul? DePaul yeah. Day? All this DePaul Day that stuff? I mean, were you surprised? Yeah, I was. Um, it was, you know, playing on the road's always tough to an extent, especially when you're a streaky team like Louisville. Uh, I'm happy they won. I mean, they could have lost. Look at what happened to Providence. 
I think I think DePaul had two runs in the first half of like sixteen and zero and twelve to one. I mean, you think of that from any team's going to go down in that. So as Kentucky did against Mississippi State, they fought back. I don't care who it is fighting back on the road, like you said, is a good. I wouldn't call it road. That was a home game. They did have a lot of. It was seventy thirty at most. That's a big Louisville. Louisville. Six, six it was. Thousand. It was ridiculous. The fans, of Louisville, congrats, good job for the Card Nation going up there. But they pulled out. That was a that was a must win. Being losing, yeah, as they were losing. Yeah, you got to win those. Yeah, it you got to really change fan morale had they lost that game. Because it would have, yeah, it would have just been a momentum killer. I mean, I especially on the road tonight against Cincinnati, you wouldn't want to, you know, as a potential two in a row loss. That would have been bad. It would have been, been tough. It'd been. Bad. You're looking at a force. I think you're all force in the Big East right now. Uh, win tonight, you know, you're gonna stay right there. A couple teams lose, you never know. You could jump into that. You might jump in that top three, top two spots. Big East, kind of, which would be huge for Louisville. It seems they always do that. Last year, they you know started out a little slow, if I remember, and f- right back to the top. <laughs> a little different um, this year because they seem to start out real hot, but they're obviously not playing anybody. Oh, yeah. But then so they, they slumped, but it was just later. So, yeah, they hopefully are coming on strong at the end of the year. Hopefully that's what's going on, and, and hopefully they'll win tonight. And um, 25 maybe- points for Carrick against DePaul. That's important. Chris Smith had 20. The senior leaders right there. I saw a lot of card card fans talking about, you know, the seniors need to step up. And I, I will agree with that. I think they, Louisville's a, you know, experienced team. Well, those two guys are your all's best scorers besides Russ Smith, I would say. The heck. Yeah, they got to score, especially Kyle Curry. They're the, they're the best scorers. I think Gorky and Shane are legitimate options down there. Oh, yeah. Uh, I honestly they, they believe if Curry isn't hot, if Curry isn't getting your points, you're, gonna lose. you're not winning. I agree. Kirik's our Darius Miller. He's the key to your team. Like Darius Miller sparked this comeback against Mississippi State. He took over. He had you know a couple. He had two threes. Dan. He had that big dunk. I don't think that Darius Miller is. Darius Miller <sighs> just has to come in in the clutch. He doesn't have to put up the points necessarily. He just has to get his little bit of points right when you need it. He needs to change your momentum. Is how I feel about Darius Miller. Kirik, he's got to put up the big numbers. He's got to get hot. I don't know. I'll, I'll check out the stats maybe on the break on that. Yeah, we'll I think there's been games that. where he's been non-existent. He didn't even and play they win, a few games. But he had a stretch where he barely. He's their, I mean, he's their number one scorer. He's their senior. Um, the games where Keurig struggles are the games when Louisville struggles, win or loss. It's just the same thing. Yeah, I mean, he he's definitely an important piece to the puzzle, but it's not foreign for him this year, last year, the year mm-hmm. before, you know, just to disappear. So I mean, it's that's not uncommon. So they got to have something. I'm hoping it's it's Wayne maybe stepping up and, and becoming. He looks a little lost out option. there on the yeah. defensive end. Obviously, he's not in game shape. He's got his big body. He's gonna be good. I think he. Will. I think he's gonna be really good. Um, like Patino, he's just weird. He's you put him in there that first game back. He had you know double figure points. Then you you really don't see him. But I guess that's just inexperience. You know, catching up. You don't want to ruin your team's chemistry. Which Louisville's got some good chemistry going on right now, regardless of a, a overtime against whoever it is. Uh. Real quick before we do go to our break, Murray State they uh, had a bracket buster game uh, over the weekend against St. Mary's. They pulled that out, sixty-five fifty-one. And Isaiah Cannon. Did anybody else watch this game besides me? All right. Okay. Well, I guess I'll be the only one to talk about it. Isaiah yeah. Cannon's a Dickie beast. Dickie B was there apparently. Dick Vitale was there. He, he had was he, awesome. he tweeted yeah. out, I believe, the next day or two that it was in his twenty plus years it was the most love he's ever got. So good job to the Murray fans. All of you, you know, they had a great time. Murray State, they're number twelve right now. Uh, they got to be the best mid major out there. Maybe they could pull a Final Four run like VCU or Butler did the past couple years. It'd be nice to see. Be Never very know. nice. So, hopefully Louisville doesn't face them in the first round. Yeah, that's. A, I didn't want to go there, but <laughs> I'll let you do that. Well, I guess we'll go ahead and get to our first commercial break here. We're gonna might be about a minute, minute and a half or so. We're gonna get Gary Parrish from CBSSports.com online, and we'll be right back. Talk about a UK UFL with national syndicated rider. Right back to Bluegrass Breakdown. Welcome back to the Bluegrass Breakdown Radio Show. I'm Kelly Patrick here. We have a very well known guest, especially within the college basketball world across the country. We have Gary Parrish. How are you doing tonight, Gary? I'm awesome. You guys okay? Doing great. Gary is a, a writer with CBSSportsLine.com. How long have you been with CBS? Uh, I think I'm five years now. I, I, I moved there in July 2006, so 
the years are starting to stack on top of each other. They've been really nice to me. Really enjoyed your work you've done there. I know that you are uh, you have some ties at least to the to the Memphis area and around here that you know has some uh, relation to the not only the rivalry Louisville's had with Memphis for many years, but also the uh, John Calipari having been the former coach there. So uh, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I grew up in Memphis, and uh, so I've been, you know, and I still I live here now. You know, because of my job with CBS, I won't say that there are better places for me to live. New York would obviously be more beneficial, uh, but it doesn't really matter where we live, as long as you got an airport close by and uh, and uh, a wife who understands your travel schedule, you can you can get away with it. So. You know, before I was at CBS, I um, covered the University of Memphis basketball program for the commercial film newspaper here in Memphis, uh, and that was four years with John. So he and I spent a lot of time to, uh, together, and I spent a lot of time around that program. So uh, John and I go back, I think, longer than maybe most college basketball writers go back with John because um, you know I have a, a, had a unique experience with him covering him basically every day for, for four years. So you had no beef with John Calipari leaving Memphis, heading to Kentucky, right? Oh, we've had plenty of beefs. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we used to fight. We used to fight all the time. I mean, uh, we, we had some classic, you know, dial each other's numbers and the first word that's the mouth out of each other's mouth or "f you" and "f you back." And, uh, we, we, I mean, we went at it. But the one thing I would always say about John is, um, I, I think we respect each other, you know. And I, I think he, so he didn't always agree with what I said, said you know, both and. And I certainly didn't always agree with the way he handled things. Um, I think we both, I think, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I, I respect him immensely as a, as a basketball coach and as a guy to, to run a program. Doesn't mean that I haven't been critical of him at times. Doesn't mean that I don't think he's full of, you know what, a lot of times. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of uh, running a college basketball program, I, I don't think there's anybody better. And uh, and he's, uh, he's obviously, he did it at UMass, he did it at Memphis, and He's doing it again right now at Kentucky. But I, I will say, our relationship, people would always describe it a couple of different ways. One, you know, the, 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 the certain people would say that we're best friends. Well, that was never true. And some <laughs> people would say we hated each other. And though I, I would say there were times where we absolutely didn't get along, again, I don't want to speak for him, but I've never hated him. And, and his, no matter where we were in that relationship, if I ever needed to speak to him on a professional level, He's always been there. I mean, I, I saw him the other night in Starkville. He's fine. And, uh, you know, so we've had our ups and downs, but um, he's, he's, he's always been professional with me, and, uh, and, and I've appreciated that. Uh, he, he was fun to cover. I think he made my job, um, you know, a little more relevant than it would have otherwise been because, he, um, you know, covering John Calipari is different than covering the University of Memphis. And I have thought many times, I wonder if I would have gotten the opportunity at CBS if I would have just been covering – Dick Price at Memphis or Josh Pastor at Memphis as opposed to covering John Calipari at Memphis. Because I was covering John, more people were interested in my work and it exposed me uh, to the people who make these kinds of hires. So I don't think I owe him my job, but I do think covering him uh, helped me get to where I'm at today. Sure. I know that during that tenure, Calipari was winning, uh, although it was in the Conference USA, was winning just an ungodly amount of games, wasn't he? I think there was some records set there. He set all you know. He, he set every record you could imagine, and and really set the bar at what is essentially an impossible level. The fans haven't quite quite come back down from that yet. And so Josh Pastner's sitting here, I think right now, ten and three records, Conference USA first place, and and it's panic, you know, around here. Like what's wrong? And the reality is, you know, Memphis has never been, uh, Memphis has never been the type of place where. Um, you know, they, they just ran over everybody until John got there in those last four years. So the idea that, um, you know, they, they now expect to win every game, that's very much, you know, related to the success that, that John had. And, and, you know, the funny thing is, you look up right now, and so the SEC and the Conference USA are two totally different leagues. I would never argue otherwise. He is overwhelming that league the exact same way he overwhelmed Conference USA. He really is. I mean, he is, hasn't lost a home game since he's been – in Lexington, and I mean, they're what's the record now? They've lost one game, fifty in a row now. Fifty now, yeah. So um, one thing that yeah, I mean, and, and, and you can even go back. I mean, there, there is a stat: he hasn't lost a home conference game in like seven years. You know, dating back to the days of Memphis. I mean, he's really been remarkable, and there, there aren't very many few things in sports. I mean, sure things in sports. Um, Nick Saban at Alabama, sure thing. I think Urban Meyer at Ohio State, sure thing. 
uh, Roy Williams in North Carolina, I thought when it happened was going to be a sure thing. And John at Kentucky, the day that it happened, you know, honestly, I never understood why they didn't hire him the first time around when they were replacing Cubby. And that's while, um, you know, I, I had covered him. I was at, I was at CBS by then, but he was always the home run hire for that program. I mean, I know why they didn't do it the first time around because, you know, some of the, you know, the other stuff that's attached to his name, vacated final four, stuff like that. Uh, sort of moved Kentucky away from him that first time around, but when they, you know, I guess dip to where they dip to under Billy Gillespie, you know, you start weighing the pros and cons, and Sean's pros uh, certainly outweighed his cons, and now you fast forward to today, the near number one team in the country, only one loss, the obvious favorite to win a national championship. Um, this was always the way this was going to go when they hired him. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, everything you say. Uh, I know you, you wrote a a little article, I believe, is yesterday or the day before about you know the Kentucky and Mississippi State game, how they the come back and just strengthen in their position as national title favorite. You know the resiliency. Uh, it was a great article. This, where's this? I mean, is this team your favorite to win it? I mean, they got to be your favorite. Are they your pick to win it? Yeah, easy. I mean, unless, unless somebody gets hurt or Anthony Davis' arm shrink or something like that. I mean, the reality is uh, they're on a different level right now, and sometimes teams win a lot of games. And you go, all right, but is the roster really built to, to, to overwhelm people? Is the roster really built for a championship? Or is this just a team who happens to keep winning? But ultimately, you know, we don't really think they're the best team in the country. I think St. Joseph's a few years ago did that. Maybe even Illinois a few years ago did that when they won all those games and lost to Carolina in the title game. Missouri this year, to some degree, won a bunch of games. We're sitting here with a very similar record at least a couple of weeks ago to what Kentucky had, but we still wondered if that's the type of roster that can that can win it all. With Kentucky, they've got the record that suggests they're really good, and they got the roster that suggests they're really good. But, you know, I know that Marcus Teague's considered a a weak link, if you will, but the pro point guard still. You know, Deron Lamb's a pro guard; he can shoot the ball. Uh, and Michael Kid Gilchrist is a pro wing, lockdown defender, leader, high motor. You know, Anthony Davis is number one pick in the draft, and he's playing like it right now. He changes the way. Kentucky plays. He changes the way people who play Kentucky have to play. And then Terrence Jones, you know, he is what he is. I think everybody, including Cal, would like him to be a little more consistent, but he's still a lottery pick big, you know, down there playing beside Anthony Davis. So, um, there's really no obvious weakness to this roster and, and the, and they don't have any of the other red flags that, that might pop up with a roster like this. Sometimes you start worrying about egos. You start worrying about guys focusing on the draft start worrying about guys pulling in different directions. There's no evidence that any of that stuff's true with this team. And then the other thing that people will, will knock them on is just that they're too young. And the only reason people say that is because we've never had a team built like this, all these young guys win a national championship. Uh, but, you know, and so I guess it's always going to be used as a, it won't happen until it happens. But I've now seen that team, you know, come back in the second half and win at Vanderbilt. I've seen the team come back in a, incredible atmosphere the other night in Starkville and win that game after not only being down 13 in the first half, but being down, you know, three possessions with fewer than eight minutes to play. And they come back. They don't get rattled. They don't, they don't uh, ever seem, you know, to shrink in the moment. And they've got everything you need to go win the whole thing. And so, listen, when you get into that tournament, you got to win six 40-minute basketball games. And in a 40-minute basketball game, anything can happen. Kick, when you're kicking, get in foul trouble. Your kid can turn an ankle. Another kid can hit eight threes on you. Um, we've seen good teams and dominant teams lose before. Uh, so if you want to take the field over Kentucky or the field over anybody, that statistically is the smart move because, you know, typically in this, the way we decide this, um, nobody is a quote favorite to win it all. Uh, but this Kentucky team's special. They've got all the pieces and, uh, I won't be surprised in the least. In fact, be my pick. Uh, to uh, cut down the nets on that first Monday down in New Orleans in April. Okay, Gary, uh, to, not to change the pace completely on you, I know it's February now, um, and March is coming up, so everyone wants to talk about, obviously, the March Madness that's impending. But on a little bit of a different note, the only comparable type of situation, or the, the most, uh, the best comparison that I can think of, to the prospect of Louisville ever landing an NBA team would be uh, that of Memphis landing an NBA team. So I figure since you were there before, you're there afterward, um, and you saw the way that it integrated within the city 
It may be the way that it impacted the Memphis basketball program. Uh, I have a couple questions. Do you think it will ever happen? Also, do you think it negatively it has negatively impacted Memphis's basketball program at all? There's no evidence that it's negatively impacted Memphis's basketball program at all. And some of that was um, because the people in town who were responsible for bringing the Grizzlies to Memphis are also heavy hitters within the University of Memphis, FedEx being the most obvious, and they were never going to pick one of the other. And so, you know, the combination, I think maybe had it happened at a time where John wasn't uh, in charge of the Memphis basketball program, it could have hurt. But because John was in charge, he went out of his way to, to A, work hand-in-hand hand with the Grizzlies, and you turn what could have been a negative into a positive, um, and, and also rally the fan base to say, listen, we can do this. And so the reality is, as I speak to you right now, the Tigers are still bigger than the Grizzlies in the city of Memphis. The Tigers still outdraw the Grizzlies in the city of Memphis. I mean, if you put Memphis and Rice on the one night and, and the, the Grizzlies and Lakers on the next, Memphis Rice is going to outdraw them. I mean, it just it, people care more than television ratings, uh, clicks on the internet in terms of stories that people write it, the commercial to the newspaper, um, radio show. Like, you know, if I want to do a two-hour radio show about the University of Memphis every day, basketball program, I can. The Grizzlies kind of come and go. Now, the Grizzlies are a big deal now because after that, after that playoff run and a big deal um, because they're sitting here at 19 and 15 going into the All-Star break. But um, this is still a Tigers town. And so I do think there is a scenario under which when you put so many games in the same week, even if you've got the same number, even if you've got tickets to everything, it becomes difficult to do. There was a time a few weeks ago where I think the Grizzlies played on Monday, Tigers played on Tuesday, Grizzlies played on Wednesday, Grizzlies played on Friday, Tigers played on Saturday. Now, I don't even care if you got tickets to all those games. You can't, if you've got a family, you can't go to all of them. It's my job to go to basketball games. I could not go to all of them. Not without getting a divorce. And so, um, that can become a little bit of an issue. But in terms of interest in Memphis basketball, season ticket sales, television ratings, there is not a single thing, not a single thing that suggests that, uh, the Grizzlies have harmed, uh, Memphis in any way. And I think if, if the University of Louisville, um, embrace the possibility the same way that the people at Memphis embrace the possibility, uh, then it, it can it can absolutely work. Gotcha. Good answer. I, I really? appreciate it. That's good. some good insight, I think. I don't know that it'll actually, you know, I don't know how feasible it is for Louisville, but um, it's definitely something that pops up over the past few years pretty consistently in the local papers and, and everything like that. I, I know that you did visit uh, Murray State recently. What did you think of uh, the far western, you know, the, the, the other part of the state? What did you think of your visit to Murray? I thought it was terrific. You know, um, even when you have a team like that that's ranked in the top ten most of the year, people still doubt it, you know, because people don't see it. And even when they do see it, they don't see it play against other nationally relevant teams or quality teams. Um, and then even if they do, it's not on television. And, and, and so for them to have that day uh, last weekend where, you know, Dick Vitale's in town and ESPN's in town and uh, the nation is really watching that game and it's on your campus. And, you know, it wasn't only the first time that um, a ranked team had ever visited Murray, Kentucky. It was the first time Murray State, as a ranked team, had ever played another ranked team. And so for them to have that day and then be able to perform well on that day, I just thought it was nice. I mean, I go to Duke all the time. I go to Kentucky all the time. I go to Carolina and Kansas. And they're big games, and they're fun. And, and But you know you've done it before, and they've done it before, and they'll do it again probably three, four days from now. Uh, with Murray you know, with Murray State the other day, you really felt like you were a, a part of something that those people in that building, those kids who played, uh, Steve, everybody involved, um, had never experienced before. And – Probably, let's be honest, we'll never experience again. And, um, and that's nice. You know, I, I can see people, you know, in that, in that community sitting around 10 years from now, 20 years from now, talking about, do you remember the day we were on national television? Dick Vitale was in the building and we beat another nationally ranked team, uh, convincingly while the nation looked on. Uh, that happens all the time at Duke. It happens all the time at Kansas. It happens all the time at Kentucky. It had never happened there. Might not ever happen there again. And uh, I, I like the story, and so um, I root for those guys. I like the I like the underdog story. I like the little guy story, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing them in March. You know, get an opportunity to to advance into that tournament and, and really you know put a nice bow on what's been a, 
a really nice present to, to not only that community, but the college basketball, too. We need stories like that, and Murray State's provided one this year. No, I completely agree. We need to see what they can do outside of the OVC, but it'll be exciting to watch. Um, I had a question about kind of officiating um, throughout the nation. Um, and, of course, you've seen a lot more nationally than, than we all have, definitely. But, of course, every fan base thinks the officials are terrible, obviously. But I, have you noticed the officiating this year, inconsistencies? I mean, how much do you think that's been – a contributing factor from you know the Xavier Cincinnati game. I'm actually a Xavier alum, so <laughs> this is this is a little bit personal to me. But I mean, how do you feel the officiating has changed since that incident, and do you think it's for the worse or for the best? Well, I think you know that was a bad day, and those officials let that get out of hand, and they let that get to a point where it never should have gotten. The reality is, I think officiating is you know they make bad calls, and I think the incident at NC State over the weekend where Carl has ejected you know, removed to former players but fans in that setting from a game, that's unacceptable. They bring that heat on themselves. I think the larger issue, it seems a little foolish to me to believe that, you know, the officiating has just gotten so bad in the year 2012 uh, that it's never been this bad before. I think the more likely scenario is that we see more than we've ever seen before. There's five games on television every single night. Uh, everything has, you know, 50,000 replays. If an official blows the call, not only does he blow it on national television, he blows it in a world where it's going to be on YouTube, it's going to be on message boards, it's going to be on Twitter, it's going to be on Facebook. And so we see the calls. You know, we, we see more than we've ever seen. And so I assure you, back in 1982, there were officials making bad calls every night. But there was no Internet. There was no Twitter. There was no uh, ESPN News. There was no instant replays. And so we just weren't aware. I just think today, uh, because of technology, we're just aware of every bad thing that happens, and it, it's sort of beaten into our skull. So, yeah, there are still problems with officiating the block charge call. Are you there? Looks like we'll get Gary back on the line. There. Okay. Sorry, are you there, Gary? Yeah, I'm here. Can you oh, hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah, we lost you for a quick second. Go ahead. Yeah, I just think that officiating is bad. You know, there's, there's complaints, and they're valid. But I, I imagine it's always been this way. We just happen to see the bad uh, because of YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and message boards and ESPN News more than we've ever seen it. Yeah, uh, you make a great point. We, no, nobody ever talks about it like as, as that standpoint. You know, you got all these social medias these days. So I think that's a good point. Uh, before we let you go, I just uh, you don't have to get into too much detail about this. Obviously, this is Kentucky. This is Louisville. Uh, who, March is coming up. We all know Rick Pitino's past. He's a hell of a coach. He still is a hell of a coach. You know, everybody judges Cal Parry saying he's just a talent guy. Who would you take in this upcoming tournament right, as of today, as the coach of your team, no matter the talent-wise? Oh, I think Rick's one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time. You know, I, I, I think he's tremendous. Um, the thing about college basketball is that it's not just about coaching. You know, coaching, actually coaching. You know, I, I've had people all the time talk about, you know, they want to come talk to me because they write about college basketball. And they say, listen, I love coaching basketball. You know, how do I go about breaking in? I said, you love coaching basketball? They said, yeah. I said, well, then you don't want to be a college basketball coach. <laughs> you want to be a high school coach. Or you want to be an NBA coach. But co college basketball is not about coaching basketball. It's about 10, 20% of the job. Uh, college basketball is about recruiting. It's about fundraising. It's about marketing. It's about selling. It's about promotion. It's about putting guys in the league. And nobody's better than that at job. So uh, I guess the best way I could say this, if I were answering honestly, I think in terms of X's and O's and being a basketball coach who can adjust on the fly and, and make adjustments in game and expose matchups and all those things, um, I would take Rick. Uh, I think he's one of the best of all time. In terms of, of running an entire program and doing everything it takes uh, to be in, in charge of a basketball program in the year 2012, I don't think there's anybody better in the world than John Calipari. And I will also say this. As somebody who's fed in on John's practice practically every day for four years, um, I think it's an unfair criticism when people say he just gets talent and wins with it. He does get talent. There's no getting around that. But not everybody wins with talent. There are, Baylor's got a really talented roster. They seem to be going the other direction right now. Mississippi State's got three pros probably on its roster. They've lost four straight games right now. It is, it is a, it is a talent and, and, and that John possesses to be able to get elite-level prospects, bring them together, get them on the same page, make them play hard, and make them guard for him. That is not simple to do. Ask Bill Self. Ask Mike Shishetsky. Ask Roy Williams. 
It is not the simplest thing to do, and he is able to do it with almost a brand new bunch pretty much every single year. So, um, and, and in terms of X's and O's, he's underrated in that. He's easy to pick on uh, because sometimes people say, ah, well, it looks like they're playing AAU ball. Well, if you've got better players than everybody else, what's wrong with letting your players be better than the other team's players? Uh, that's coaching too. And so, um, you know, if, if the, if the question, who's the better X and O's coach, Rick Patino or John Calipari, I would probably say Rick Patino, but I think John's underrated as an X and O's coach. And in terms of assembling talent and getting it to play hard, I don't think there's anybody better in the country. That's definitely a, a, a good point, in my opinion, Gary, about the uh, level of defense that he's gotten his team to play this year. And that's certainly a testament to your coaching ability. Um, Gary, we want to let you know that we really appreciate you coming on our show. As far as, you know, the totem pole, we realize we're not necessarily too far up there. Uh, but you certainly are pretty high up there. and We really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you very much, Gary. Ha- have a good one. No, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you guys having me, and I'll catch up with you down the road. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Gary. Have a good night. Right, thanks, man. Another, another good interview with uh, Gary Parrish from CBSSports.com. Uh, we will take a quick break. We'll get right back. Uh, then we're going to have Brent Lepping, Lepping from Louisville Sports Live. Louisville Sports Live dot net. Uh, he'll be on. And we'll talk Cardinals since we talked about a bunch of UK with Gary. So we'll be back in just a moment. Bluegrass Breakdown. Welcome back to the Bluegrass Breakdown Radio Show. We have Brent Lepping from Louisville Sports Live dot net on the line with us. How are you doing tonight, Brent? I'm doing really good, fellas. Appreciate you all having me on. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for coming on. I know that. Uh, Everything at Louisville Sports Live has been really picking up, and um, it's funny. It, it seems that you all kind of started out maybe in a similar way uh, to how we have, kind of just some guys who are real into sports, and, and you've, you've done so well with it that you've been picked up by ESPN. You mind telling us a little bit about how that happened? Yeah. Um, it was just over a year ago, actually. Um, Ethan Moore and myself, were we were actually at the gym when the whole idea was – um, kind of conceived and the afternoon underdogs were doing a, a live remote at, uh, at LAC. And, and he and I had been talking for a while. You know, we listen to the afternoon shows and we're big sports talk show guys, whether it's in the morning on the way to work or in the afternoon when you're getting off and at night whenever you can. And, um, we started talking and, 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 and see, there's, I don't want to give the wrong impression here because I love it all. I love shows that are about pro sports, college sports, U of all, and UK. I love your all show. You know, you, you, you see, you do both sides. It's a great show. It's a great concept. But as we were talking, we got into the whole, well, there's a, you know, there's a Kentucky sports radio uh, here in Louisville that does all Kentucky. Who knows how many UK only shows there are in Lexington and the other cities. But here we are in Louisville, and, and that particular day, the afternoon underdogs were talking about everything except for Louisville, and it was right during the swing of, of the college basketball season. And um, and we started talking, we're like, this is not an all U of L sports talk show here in the city of Louisville, which is absurd. And right down the spot, we're like, I'm, let's do something about it. And we, we, we started, we looked into, uh, uh, into starting just doing some podcasts, and uh, we leaned on a few people to get started, and you know, we went to Inside the Ville's uh, editor and publisher, Mike Hughes, who who helped us out in return for sort of having him on, him on as a guest from time to time. He let us post things on his site, and we formed a, a bond and a friendship with him. We went to Mike Rutherford of Card Chronicle, and he was great to us as well. He let us post links to our podcast and things like that. And, and we went to see guys like Matt Jones even, too, from Kentucky Sports Radio, and he, he gave us some advice about doing the podcasting thing since that's kind of how they got started. And uh, through everything, we, we started using the power of Twitter and – uh, we ended up tracking down some guests, guys like Jeff Goodman and Brett McMurphy that, that sort of sort of helped us out in the early stages. And uh, from there, we met with Kenny and Rocco, the SIDs at Louisville, and they helped us get ex-players, current players, coaches, things like that. And it started to snowball, and then we met with the guys from ESPN who showed a little bit of interest. And uh, uh, the rest is history, I guess. They offered us a shot to do um, Wednesday night shows, and then we were actually doing post-game for U of L basketball as well. But Ethan and I are both, uh, we're both fans first, and they wanted to do the show immediately after the, the horn sounded, and, and we couldn't peel ourselves away from the games early, and, and, and having to leave early kind of got in the way of our fandom, so we gave that up. We're just doing the one-day-a-week thing, and we're running the blog, and yeah, everything seems to be going pretty well. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's exactly basically how we got started. You had Kelly and Matt, they kind of just 
got heads together and you know they wanted to start up the kind of the same thing you know we looked around there's really wasn't a UK and U of L show uh, website exactly, type yeah. thing so we hopped onto that they you know got it started and our our one year is actually next week so we know exactly you know what what the work takes and we've had some pretty good guests coming on I mean, we got you we had Gary Parrish just now we've had it's a good thing so we're right down the same alley as you all are yeah it's a lot of fun you gotta makes it a lot easier when it's something you really enjoy doing and uh, talking about so to to get to the thing that everybody likes talking about that I like talking about actually I'm surrounded by Kentucky fans here uh, <laughs> Going into the, the game tonight against Cincinnati at Cincinnati, my, my question to you is, what are you looking for, not only for the Cards to win tonight, but so that you will feel good going forward into this last stretch of games before the Big East Tournament? What would you like to see tonight? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, at this point, you have to remain sort of cautiously optimistic about the Cards. I'm still... I'm still not 100% sold because they've they've mostly been feeding on a lot of the bottom feeders and mid-level teams here in the Big East uh, in route to winning seven out of the last eight games. But they, they really haven't, you know, they, they came up just short against Syracuse. They lost to Marquette. They lost to Notre Dame. So they really haven't beaten the top-tier teams yet in the conference. They lost to Georgetown. And I'm, Cincinnati has the same conference record. They're nine and five. I think they're a very similar team. They're sort of a defense, defensive minded team. Nick Cronin's an outstanding defensive coach. And so they sort of approach the game the same way that Rick does. Their the teams are sort of mirror images of each other. I worry because they've, they've had our number lately. They've won uh, two out of the last three games. Nick was obviously an assistant here, so he knows what Rick wants to do. And that's a tough place to play too. I know there'll be some Louisville fans in attendance, but, I worry that the scoring has been inconsistent, not only all year, but even recently. You know, you have a game in the 50s against Syracuse, and then you score 90 in overtime against the Paul. There's no consistency to it. And and that's the one thing that concerns me. I know uh, Cincinnati sort of switched to a four-guard lineup here, and they've won three out of their last four games since they made that move. So I anticipate that Rick will probably start big and then see where it goes from there if he has to adjust and and go back to that four-guard lineup that they saw some success with uh, in the second half against the Paul. I would anticipate they do that. That said, with that size advantage, I wouldn't be surprised if Shane Mahanen stepped up and had a big game. I think Wayne will get some more minutes to play a little bit more than he did against the Paul. And all things be told, I think this game, it's, it's bigger for Cincinnati in the fact that they didn't have a great out-of-conference schedule before the conference slate started, and, and they lost a few games in that pre-conference schedule. Um, Louisville, on the other hand, is pretty much a lock for the NCAA tournament. Cincinnati is not. They're still fighting for an NCAA tournament berth, whereas the Cards are fighting for that top four bid uh, to get the double buy in the NCAA tournament. I think this is going to be a hard-fought game. I think it'll be really close. I, I hope and I and I think I have an inkling that the Cards are going to squeak by a close one, but I anticipate a grinder maybe in the early 60s. And I think it's going to be a great game. Yeah, Mick Cronin actually has my favorite quote of the year, maybe the last five years, saying that he's the only coach in America that has white guys that can't shoot. That was pretty, <laughs> pretty exactly awesome. Right, yeah. But uh, we were talking about the game, you know, in the first segment of the show, and me and the Kentucky fans in here are actually the ones who said we think we'll, we'll, we'll pull this one out. Kelly here, the, the lone card, is kind of on the other end of aspect. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about tonight. I, I'll say uh, at best I think it's a 50-50 game. I don't know why. I don't have a – a ton of reasoning behind that. I hope Shane Behan and the Yancey Gates don't get into a fight. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think you're dead on. Look, the uh, the wise guys in Vegas gave uh, gave Cincinnati the one and a half point favorite. Now, granted, you usually get two or three points just for playing at home, but I think you're exactly right. I think this thing is split down the middle. These teams are incredibly evenly matched. Um, I, Nick always wants to mi mix it up and, and really muddy the water and make this a really tough, hard-fought physical game. You know, Rick likes to do the same thing. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that Yancey and Shane will get in a fight. And I think that's, but you, you bring up an interesting point. How will Cincinnati doesn't play nearly as much zone as Louisville does, so they like to play a little bit more of a trapping man and man style. So if Yancey Gates is guarding Gorgie Jane, like I mentioned, that might free up Shane to have a, a, a really key size advantage and strength advantage down the lower block. And uh, if, if for some reason Gates switches off and Zhang gets in foul trouble, then that's what it'll be interesting to see what Rick does. It should be sort of a chess game to see which lineup he ends up going with. Will he go big and try to exploit the size advantage? 
Or if Cincinnati starts to, to out quick the cards on the perimeter and wants to get up and down, will he have to switch to the small lineup? It'll be interesting. And I think you're right. It's, it's very evenly matched. It could go either way. Yeah, I, I, I read where Rick had said that despite Cincy, how they're doing the four guard lineup with the anti gates in the middle, that Rick is going to stick with his regular lineup. He's going to have Shane and he's going to have Gorky in there. I don't really take much from that. I wouldn't be surprised if we, I yeah. mean, who knows what we're going to see from Rick. No, it, it, come on. I mean, it's Rick speak anymore. It's like we take it with a grain of salt. That man, just whatever comes out of his mouth, you can almost expect the opposite at this point. So I, I agree with him. I think that's the lineup that'll start. But what you'll see after five or six minutes will be dictated by what goes on in the game. He, he can't even foresee that, you know? So I think it'll depend on how the game starts and what sort of look Cincinnati gives, you know? Maybe they'll switch into that zone and, and create some different problems that way. And look, the bottom line is whether they go big or small, if Gorgie Zhang gets into foul trouble, then all bets are off. So he's got to stop those over the back and reaching fouls that have gotten him into foul trouble here recently because he's, he's just vital inside the, the two, three zone in the back offensively on a post. He's got to, he's got to regain his composure and start scoring a little bit more for the cards to be effective. And, and I think that'll be a key to watch too. Yeah. I think Peyton Siva staying out of foul trouble is also very important. Um, yeah. One of the things I think about the, the, the upside for Louisville this year is I know that everybody jokes about it, but I really think Wayne Blackshear is really good. Um, I think that he has the potential to be a difference maker, maybe not tonight, but down the stretch for Louisville. How, how, if, how many points, or I'm sorry, how many minutes do you think Wayne will play tonight? I think he'll play quite a bit. I wouldn't be surprised if he played somewhere like 15 to 18, something a little bit more aligned with what he did at West Virginia. The simple fact that, again, this is a smaller team that Cincinnati has, and Wayne's a tough physical guy, and he's got great size for a guard. So I anticipate that he'll play quite a bit more. The, the matchup against DePaul just wasn't a good one for him. I, I think defensively he was lost, and he still is at times, which could cost him, I think, some second-half minutes. But I expect to see a lot of him in the first half. I wouldn't be surprised to see him get 10 minutes in the first half. Again, just sort of depending on the way the game is flowing and, and the way the defense is, is sort of being dictated. But I expect him to – to have a good game as well. I think he'll bounce back. I think he's still limited defensively because you know, people make a big deal about it, but it's true. Rick sometimes overcomplicates things on defense, things on defense, and he's got a late start to the game. So if he's still lost on defense, his minutes are going to be limited, particularly down the stretch if it's a tight game. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. We just had uh, Gary Parrish on. We talked a little bit about uh, officiating, how awful it's been this year across all of college basketball. Obviously, you know, Louisville and Cincinnati, it's basically a rivalry game. It's, two teams are going to go at it. Could this be one of those games where refs just absolutely ruin it? I hope not. I mean, the, my big thing with the refs is, and I usually I'll do the game recap on our website after after each game, and I hate that ever blaming the outcome of a game on referees. I just think it's sort of a cop-out because usually there's something else that sort of led to those bad calls. or can't always blame it just on that. But I, I can't ever remember uh, a season where there was more inconsistency. And by that I mean, you know, you watch a Big East game, especially if you're up close, they, they, let, they let the guys murder each other underneath. They, they get away with anything they want, particularly when they're fighting for space, when the ball's out on the perimeter. When they're trying to get position underneath, I mean, they kill each other. But then they call these tic-tac fouls up top to where if anybody even so much as reaches a hand in, they call it. And you know, there's hardly any contact. And my big problem is the consistency. And, and, and at some point, unless they address that, it's going to continue to be a problem. And games are not going to be evenly called. And the, and the bigger issue is, you know, we're used to Big East referees here, and, and they call a game one way. Well, when you get in the NCAA tournament, maybe you're scared to do certain things or you start playing tentative defense. That's where it can come back and bite you and get you in trouble, and that's the thing I worry about. Sure. Not to you know switch gears completely on you. Uh, I was personally excited when I heard that it's even possibly a rumor that Jordan Whiting will be will be coming back to Louisville. Do you happen to have any insider you know perspective, or what? What do you think? You think that'll happen? You know, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't. All I've heard of the rumors and that article from Advocate, I think it was, that popped up on the Ohio State uh, website. And I read it. It was pretty vague. Um, we asked Mike about that um, off air yesterday, and this, it doesn't sound like there's much there, there's there's much behind it at this point. You know, he's a hometown kid. He's from Trinity. He was a huge recruit coming out, a four-star guy who went to Ohio State, and who could blame him at that point? They had gone to three straight BCS games, and they were absolutely unstoppable. 
Then, of course, everything happens with Jim Tressel, and, and now they've got Urban Meyer, who just, quite honestly, has a different philosophy and, and, is, and is bringing in a, a ridiculous recruiting class right off the bat. And he probably sees the writing on the wall. I think he's a, a talented player, but he's he's been a little underused at Ohio State and just really hasn't fit in. I, I think most likely Urban was putting feelers out and asked Charlie about it, and I'm sure he probably had some interest. And in the end, it's going to be the kid's decision. If he comes, we'll welcome him with open arms. But to answer your question, I, I really don't know uh, too much about the situation and certainly don't have any kind of inside information. We will have to wrap it up here soon. Um, I'll get a couple things from you first, though. Maybe a prediction on the game tonight and also a prediction as to how far the Cards basketball team goes this season. Yeah, um, I, I think the game will be somewhere around 60 to 58. Uh, again, I think that this thing is it's razor thin between these two teams. It could go either way. I think I, I like the way Louisville's been playing, and they, they continue even in a game against DePaul, who they should beat. Um, they played terrible defense throughout the game, but it, they didn't, they're not giving up. They're, they're, they've learned from some of the mistakes earlier in the season. Providence comes to mind. Uh, so even if they get down, I like the way the team has been playing lately. I think they'll eke one out. As far as down the stretch, well, if they if they win this one, they should take care of both South Florida and Pittsburgh at home, and then I worry about Syracuse on the road. So if they can win three out of the last four, that should get them that fourth position for a double bye in the Big East tournament, which should get them, I would think, a four seed, which is a decent seed, all things considered. And you know, from there, just you guys know, it's all about matchups. It's so hard to predict how far a team's gonna go until you see who they're paired with on Selection Sunday, who's in their region. Uh, you know, the tournament especially more so than the regular season or anything else is just all about matchups because you're fighting for your life and it's impossible to predict. I, you know, I know a lot of people this year have, have given Rick a hard way to go and I, I gave him some, some grief at times too. But look, Louisville's also suffered a lot of injury problems this year and you can't overlook that. I don't want to give him a total pass. I, I think back to back first round flameouts are pretty unacceptable for a program of Louisville stature. So if they don't make it to at least, I mean, at least the second weekend, I, I'm going to have a huge problem with that. Um, and because you can look to next year, and I think Louisville will have a great team next year, but how many years do we have to keep saying that next year, next year, next year? I know injuries were a big part of the problems earlier in the season, and I, I don't blame Rick for that. But again, he's got a pretty nice team right now, and they're only going to get better here over the next two weeks, three weeks even. So I, I would be incredibly disappointed if they don't at least make it at least to the Sweet 16 because – there's there's too much talent not to. Well, Brent, we really appreciate you coming on. Um, thank you very much. We'll have to have you on sometime again soon. Yeah, vice versa, guys. I appreciate uh, appreciate y'all having me on. Enjoy reading your all's website and listening to your show. You guys are doing a great job and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brent. Have a good night. Take care, guys. We're going to take a quick break, come back for – we'll have an ex extra segment this week. Kind of had two guests, which is fine by us. You all would rather hear them talk anyway, so we'll come back. Time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we'll come back. Get the. We have a few more news to just get across, and uh, just so you know, UK women are uh, up twenty-three to twenty-one at halftime. This is the Bluegrass Breakdown. We'll be right back. We're back in the Bluegrass Breakdown radio show. That song is for Dakota Fanning. It's her birthday. Happy Woo! birthday, Dakota. I hate Dakota Fanning. It, that's why we did Happy it. Happy birthday. She had a great movie, Wardle. We're world of the worlds, where the hell it's called. It's horrible. I was lying. It's a terrible movie. Anyways, happy birthday, Dakota. Um, I, I just read this during the interview with Brent that possible Temple moving into the Big East. Yep. That's uh, is that a Rick Pitino move again? Is Rick just is he this the Rick Pitino it. conference called the Big Pitino? He predicted it. He predicted uh, it. Seems to be catering to. I mean, I certainly hope. That the Big East people are not. At least they're in the East this time. <laughs> yeah, that the Big East people are not making decisions based yeah. on what Patina says. As Louisville, what are you doing, Daniel? Could possibly end up shake out, weight out of, it out. out. She out is shake weight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working my. You I'm are ruining the breakdown lounge over there. I'm working my steps. This is what happens. See, if someone would come and join me and be my friend, we're supposed to have Adam Bird here tonight. Shake weight. Oh, Adam God. Bird was supposed to be here. He's a Kentucky fan. We, he hasn't. He hasn't been a long time. He hasn't been around here. It's been a while since we've had him on the show. So, uh, Adam, thanks for bailing on us again. So we appreciate it. Shake weight. But um. Whatever. Just going to be a quick segment. We had a 
a few more news tidbits to get across. First, I'd like to start off, uh, if you want to give us a call about those past two interviews we had with Gary Parrish and Brent Lepping, great interviews, hit our uh, brucees.com call-in line. That number is 502-265-5211. Uh, we'd love to hear from Cats fans, Card fans. I'm going to get some Murray State fans. We don't need that. Uh, mm -hmm. None of your friends, at least. Then, uh, yeah, the brucees.com, they got great glasses, polarized sunglasses that open bottles, get your parents start prying today. Check them out. They're uh, good things. Matt's got the uh, pictures up. If you, you can't really tell. Look at that. That's awesome. It's opening up a bottle with the back of his glasses. You're tailgating. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to carry a bottle open around. You got your glasses. It's open good, your it's good stuff. I know you have beautiful hair. You're not a glasses connoisseur. <laughs> but your hair is looking really slick tonight. It's because he has so much sweat. He keeps sleeking it back. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, check it out. Brucey's.com. It's good stuff on there. UK women, check them out. They're playing Vandy right now. They're up at halftime. Just said that. Uh, JB Holmes, I think he had brain surgery a year or so ago, if I'm right. Does anybody else remember this blog post, Matt? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, he's, he, got, he finished top 10 last week, the Northern Trust Open. Congrats to him. Yeah, you know. people wondered if that's going to be the, the end of him, but mm -hmm. apparently it's not. Yeah, so. they, were, they nobody knew if he, you know, it was one of those things that was just up in the air, I guess. So congrats to JB Holmes for, you know, he's. 100% covered, doing good things. How about uh, Kentucky High School Athletic Association adding the, the bass fishing? I can't that is awesome. That. No, that's <laughs> awesome. You don't like it, Danielle? <laughs> she's from, she's from so the ridiculous. South End. She, 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 she don't oh, really? Okay. How is that? So oh, there's a great Do graphics. Do you even not like fishing? They do. Because I hate fishing. Oh, is that what kind of fish is that, Matt? It looks like a carp. No, it's a bass. A, a crappie, not a carp. <laughs> that's impressive. It is impressive. Matt's How doing good things. How did you have things. that ready, man? Watch I'm just Danielle a skilled watch. producer. Do it, do it, Matt. Do it again. Watch. Let Danielle see it. There it goes. Ah! Little fish. <laughs> yeah, Congrats to Kentucky High School That's for. That's freaky. Uh, my question is, how do you make the raw? How do you make your team? Because I mean, how do you have tryouts for that? What do you do? Biggest bluegill wins. I mean, I, I'm assuming Catch the most it has fish to be. It has to be like an individual thing. Who's got like, their own boat? It goes by like a lot of people. It doesn't take a lot to have a boat. Go buy yourself a boat at the age of 16. Well, I'm not buying a boat. Okay. It, it takes a lot to get a boat. Well, I'm not going to fish anytime. The last time I fished, I broke a line and I got in trouble. So I will never fish again. How did you get in? Who, who Put your Mickey Mouse shirt on. I went. <laughs> a creepy sounding question. Well, it sounds like that's No, I went, I went on this lake thing with my ex-boyfriend who was like, you have to fish. Fishing is awesome. And I was like, I don't want to fish. And he was like, you're going to fish. He's out. not a real man. So he's like, come here, man oh, up, fish. And then her. like, I was like, I don't know how to do it. He's like, yes, you do. Do it. And then You're live on a breakdown. Line. Who do we got? Hi, my name is Jeremy. Jeremy, how you doing tonight? Hi, Jeremy. How are you? Good, good. Good. I just call me to congratulate Danielle on her athleticism. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> we keep the going. The shake weight. The shake weight. Isn't I'm really good right. at the shake weight. That's the men's yeah, one. It's not even the women's one. Already. So there you go. Was is, is, is that all you got, Jeremy? So it's. Come on, yeah, Jeremy. I know you. That's, I know that's you got fine. That's I've known Jeremy for a lot of years. Calls. We appreciate so, the call, Jeremy. Wait. What, Jeremy? You still there? I am. Keep Jeremy on. Okay. Keep, Jeremy okay, knows the stuff. What do you want to talk about? Let's talk about UK, Jeremy. What do you want to talk about? What about it? <laughs> what did you, you think about? What did you think about the Mississippi State game? Uh, I was actually busy that night. Sorry. Are you serious? <laughs> Ole Miss? Anything? Where do you think they're going to go in the tournament? Uh, Ole Miss happened when I was driving from DC to here. Oh, so I was oh that's true. He just car, moved. Going, going absolutely nuts, swerving everywhere. Where do you think they're? <laughs> that's good. Where do you think they're uh, going to go in the tournament? Uh, number one overall. Number one overall. We'll take that. Do you think they're definitely going to win it? Will they win it? I'll say Final Four, maybe championship. I don't know about win. Who's going to beat them? Ohio State's pretty nasty. I can't even talk about Ohio State. I'm scared of Ohio State. Well, they're I'm... cheaters, but, I mean, they might win from cheating. Yep. You never know. We'll find out. Some, close enough. Thanks for the call, Jeremy. Thanks for coming on. No, no, a, a casual call. 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 Just calling Daniel out for shake weight skills over there. It's totally good. That it's the men's one, too. Awkward. It's impressive. The men's uh, one. Uh, UK, <laughs> UofL baseball, softball, they both recently started. UofL baseball is 3-1. Their softball team, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about you know softball or if it was good or anything, but that's impressive. Uh, UK baseball, they're 3-0. UK softball, they're 4-5. and five. Uh, Oh, oh, oh. Rules crazy. so much better at softball. You guys suck. It's crazy. Uh Norlin's Noel has officially said he wants to go somewhere that he will play right away and win a championship. So if I have to guess, he's going to sign the dotted line to Kentucky. 
there's not too many options of there to play right away. He did visit with who? Uh, uh, so he's visited a few Mayheim. places. Yeah, Syracuse. He went to Syracuse. He could definitely he could win play a title there. there. He can live inside that paint in the zone. I definitely can see that as a shot blocker. Uh, Hakeem Smith, thanks to John Hancock, our great Louisville man, uh, they he made the SI.com all all two star team. Congratulations. Means he wasn't wasn't directly rated coming out. Um, I don't know how we're crediting that to John Hancock. Yeah, I was just saying for putting the post up. That's all. Oh, okay. I was just getting John's name out there. He hadn't been here in a few weeks. Was he here last week? I don't remember. So. Guys, we're gonna wrap the show up. Are we? Oh, I, oh, wait. I do have to get this out here. Uh, it's our, we have a, a giveaway coming up. It's for the weekend. It's UK plays Vanderbilt Saturday, and. I advertise our Brucey's.com glasses. Matt, if you want to throw that up there just so everybody can see what they're trying to win again. If you can send us a tweet at KY Sports Co. If you want to send us an email to the website, KentuckySports.co, just get us, get, us, get us on our Facebook. There's multiple ways. I think we're going to do a blog post as well, Matt, uh, showing about this little giveaway. But if you can predict the score, with the, the closest person to predict the score, the UK and Vanderbilt game, and as a tiebreaker, add Anthony Davis's blocks on there because you never know somebody might be you know, tied up. You win yourself a free pair of Brucey's.com sunglasses. Uh, they're sweet. You'll definitely wear them while you're tailgating for football in the spring. So uh, again, get us on the website KentuckySports.co. There's a, a Kai Sco Facebook page. Uh, there's a KentuckySports.co Facebook page. I mean, tweet one of us. Just get your uh, get your predictions in. Again, it's predict a score close to it. Box. If you win, you might be cheering this right here. Who do you play for? Ooh, well. <laughs> I heard this on 93.1 the other day, and I was freaking out. Kelly, you, you're freaking out. I like it. <laughs> I bet you do. So again, get on there, send us the email. Closest score, UK Vanderbilt game. And don't forget to add Anthony Davis's blocks for the tiebreaker. Uh, you'll win yourself a free pair of glasses. Uh, Bellarmine, North Kentucky, they play tonight. They're actually playing right now. It's number two, Bellarmine versus number eight. So it's a big-time game up in uh, North Kentucky. You can check that out on the radio, WGTK AM 970. So listen to that. you probably catch the second half. Uh, anything else from you before we head out here? Nope, go yeah. Cards. Go Cards. They tip off here in about 50 minutes. Danielle, anything else? I'm good. Well, Matt, just, let's awesome just go show. out with that song. Since the Cards are playing, we'll, we'll go out with L1C4, this one. L1C4. L1C4. We'll be... You guys love it. We all love it. We all love it. I do love it. I've already bought my t-shirt. Oh, God. We'll be back in next <laughs> Thursday night, 7 o'clock, with another great guest. Maybe two. You never know. John Hancock's lining up left and right. So uh, check in. And congrats to Rajon Rondo for making an all-star team for uh, Joe Johnson injury. We are the Bluegrass Breakdown. This is Kelly Patrick, Daniel Chilton, my man Matt McCarthy. We'll see you all next Thursday. Who do you see for?